Today I'm going to talk to you about the um, about basic genetics, what genetics is do and how genetics is moving into the genomic area by increasing the size, the scope and uh, the quality of genetic studies. We can close the door. So <clears throat> The origin of all of this is, uh, I, I will put myself at, at the particular time point, and the origin of all of this is the publication of the, human, of the results of the Human Genome Project, the first draft of, of the Human Genome. And when they announced the publication of the Human Genome, uh, the first item of the future agenda was a SNP map. And they said the SNP map promises to revolutionize both mapping disease and tracking human history. And I will try to show you how you do both using SNPs. And if you don't know what SNPs are, hold on your breath, you will know it in a second. Uh, please. Um, SNPs, SNPs are, uh, I will tell you in a in, in second more, in more in detail, SNPs are, no, are things called single nucleotide polymorphisms. And there are subtle variations in, uh, in the human genome across individuals. What does it mean? It means that one of the most startling statistics out of the genome project is that we're all similar, very, very similar at genetic level. But there are some very, very subtle variations, one base swap here and there, that make us different. And most of all, makes our genomes different. And uh, what you can say is that this is the real meat of the human genome. People paid billions of dollars not for the curiosity of a handful of scientists, but because the promise was that once we know the human genome, it would be easier to track down the genetic causes of diseases and the genetic causes of, uh, and the possibly uh, find some cure for them and get a better understanding. And as you will see, SNPs are the real meat of, uh, of, uh, of the human genome. So I will start from the 80s uh, when people started thinking about, uh, seriously thinking about developing a human genome project. And the human genome project, I will tell you what our genetic polymorphisms are, what genetic polymorphisms are, what type of polymorphism exists. And then we'll give you some basic terminology of what uh, are the terms that geneticists use to uh, describe the properties of a genome. And then I will talk to you about the real interesting stuff, which are complex traits. Are those traits, those diseases, those observable features of an individual that don't come from one single gene, but they are the result of an interaction of more genes or the interaction of genes with the environment? And I will tell you why these traits are complex. And then I will tell you how people design this kind of these experiments to identify these complex traits and also the simpler ones. And once they have designed it, I will tell you how do you analyze this data once you have them. And then I will tell you what's the word on the street on uh, the latest fashion in, uh, uh, in analyzing the genome. So <clears throat> as I was saying, the intuition behind genetics is that we can find causes for diseases without knowing the actual mechanism of the disease, just associating changing, changing in the genome to observable traits, observable characters. Now, as you can imagine, this is not really an easy idea to sell. And when people started selling it in the early 19th, uh, um, 20th century, um, people didn't really like it a lot especially biologists, to say, what well, kind of science is this? There is no mechanism in this. There is no understanding of how these things work. But then people started to deliver results. And they'll deliver results about this. Well, once we know that gene exists, before it was kind of difficult, but I will show you how you did it before, uh, before knowing what, what, uh, how to, to genotype somebody. But one of the, the main intuitions that changed everything is due to a guy called David Boston that in 1997 showed that there are natural markers on the genome called polymorphisms that make us different and make his, his, his genome different, 
right? So if I have a little change in my population, what I can try to do is collect people that have the disease and collect people that don't have the disease and see which marker shows up more than I would expect uh, in one, one group or another. And that will tell you how you play these games. You can play them in, in, in several ways. But the way in which we rely, we, do, we conduct these studies is not by tagging something, but leveraging on natural tags that are exactly these polymorphisms. This is just a summary of the Central Dark Molecular Biology. You all know this. You got a class from Dr. Butte, I think, about this. Some of you have a master and PhDs in biology, so they know this better than I do. Um, the assumption is that there is a DNA that is all identical in all our cells, and then this is translated in uh, RNA, and RNA is then turned into proteins, which determines whatever we can observe of somebody. Uh, the traits, the disease is susceptible to, is physiology, the metabolism, even drug resistance. So the idea that polymorphisms could be used as natural markers created exactly the background of the Human Genome Project. Because at that point, we had an intellectual tool, a scientific tool, to track down diseases using the code. So the easiest thing we can do is to find out diseases that are caused by one single screw up in one gene. And there are various ways in which this can actually be uh, sc uh, screw up or not. They can be dominant or recessive. Uh, recessive means that you need to, you know, you receive two uh, chromosomes, one from your father and one from your mother. To be recessive, you need to have both chromosomes that are screwed up, uh, your gene on both chromosomes. To be dominant, one is going to be enough. And uh, uh, we classify these diseases also by another dimension, which is if it's on uh, the X chromosome, which is as this asymmetry for men, and, uh, or if it's in any other chromosome. So if it's in any other chromosome, it's going to be an autosomal and can be dominant or recessive. And examples are the Huntington disease and cystic fibrosis. And if it's uh, X-link, um, it can be dominant or recessive. And that will give you right away a little example of this. Today, there are about 400 single gene diseases that have been identified. So for 400 diseases, we know that there is a little screw up. Sometimes there is a very, very simple reason, because a, a, a base is turned from um, uh, being a normal base coding for amino acid into a stopping sequence. So when that particular sequence is read, the protein is, no, no, not, is not called after that particular point and the protein is screwed up, and this, this creates disease. Um, OK, so I need, uh, this is the boring part. I need to give you, I need to give you um, a, little, a little terminology. Now, an allele is a sequence of DNA bases. So for each SNP, for each gene, for each uh, whatever, for each piece of your DNA, you have two alleles. One coming from your mother and one coming from your father. The locus is a physical location on the chromosome. It's like tiny hole. We know exactly where it is. We know it's there. We know in what, on which chromosome is it. And we know the position of the chromosome. Linkage is a, a proximity of two alleles on the chromosome. I leave this kind of ambiguous because, as you will see, proximity may have several meanings in genetics. The marker is an allele with a particular position that we can track down somehow. The distance, the physical distance, is uh, the number of bases between one point and another. But this is not the only distance we have, and actually it's not really the most interesting uh, distance we have. The most interesting distance is the probability that two points on the chromosome will be recombined when you make your chip. And the distance, this probabilistic distance, doesn't necessarily map on, uh, on, on the chromosome with a constant number of bases, as you will see in a second. So there are, this means that there are points on the chromosome that are easier to recombine, and points on the chromosome that are harder to recombine. 
less likely to recombine. Um, the measure by which we uh, uh, identify this probabilistic distance is called centimorph. A phenotype is an observable character, it can be you know, susceptibility to a disease, it can be um, diabetes, a disease itself. The genotype is the internally coded inherited information, so it's a piece of DNA. And the penetrance, uh, the penetrance is, if you take the, th series, the uh, uh, frequentist interpretation seriously, is the probability that given that you have the allele, you will develop the phenotype. Okay. So the physical distance between two alleles are base pair, but the recombination among them is not is not constant. Um, well, you all know Mendel's first law. We know that allele pairs separate when the gamete is is, is is formed, and they are randomly reshuffled and create new pairs. Now, use a, a, the, the the probabilistic measure we want to use is is the probability that two points will be recombined at the next passage to the next generation. So we can say that on average, one centimorgan, which is the probability of 1% of being recombined, is about, happens between one, one megabasis. Every one megabasis, you have one probability of being recombined. Now, these are kind of little gossips. If the human autosomal physical map is a, a, three, a three billion basis, as, as, as you know. The linkage map in centimorgan, that is this probabilistic distance between points, is different between humans and uh, between male and female humans. Uh, there are 2,800 uh, centimorgan for male and uh, 4,200 centimorgan for females. Why that? Female have a bigger genetic code. Male have this little Y wimpy chromosome, and females have this second big beautiful X chromosome, which is much bigger than ours. Less stable, but big. Uh, but if you compute the difference between these two things, you see that the probability of recombination of, uh, uh, of uh, the correspondence between uh, the probability of recombination for male and female is also different. One is a bigger, uh, a, a bigger code. Um, and so the difference, you were saying, is about one, on average, is one million per, uh, uh, one centimorgan for one million basis. And for, female, for male and female is about a bit more than a million for male and a bit less than a million for females. And uh, one notion that would be absolutely important for our ability to use markers is co-segregation. The fact that two alleles are transmitted together to the next generation. Sure. You're upset, you're upset because I said that women have better chromosomes than we have now. Um, the the question I had is just back on the definition of the lobus, and um, I just wanted to see that those things, can, are those affected by, like, uh, since it's the physical location on a chromosome, um, can the locus of a particular allele change if, if, like if the, the packing into the chromosome structure is altered in any way? Or is that something That's a very good question. So, and, well, and then the follow-up to that is, if that is the case, does that affect yeah. So this is a very good question. You can imagine a locus as a variable and an allele as a state of this variable. So you have you are given this locus and uh, at position 3022 of chromosome 5, you have an A. And if this is a polymorphism, if this is not polymorphism, as everybody has an A. But if uh, this is a polymorphism, uh, we expect that something like above 1% of the population will have a different letter there, like a T or a G. Now, this is due to mutations, and there is nothing we can, it's not affected by the locus. But the packaging of the genes of the chromosomes, where they are next to each other, may affect the probability that it will be transmitted together. So there are several reasons why this linkage is equilibrium exists. One is the physical recombination of this, which is very difficult to identify. 
And the second are historical reasons. As we tell you in a second, uh, Caucasians come from a handful of people who left Africa. And this handful of people were basically exterminated in this process. So we all come from a very, very restricted number of people that were alive between 25 and 50,000 years ago, which is a blink of an eye from an evolutionary point of view. So if you look at the map of, a, 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 um, of a, an African-American population or an African population and a European population, you will see that there is a staggering difference in the variability of those and our variability. Now, if you look at our things, you may, if you do a genotype study of Caucasians, you will see alleles that go together. But you will not be able to say if this allele go together for equal physical recombination or simply because you live, we live, we, we, we draw our genetic codes from a depleted pool in which only very few combinations are available. Does that answer your question? I have a picture in a second that may be helpful in this. Um, so let me let me go back to to to, uh, to how this a, 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 a single uh, a single disease works and how dramatic can be the effect that a single disease has. Hemophilia, as you know, is an excellent recessive disease that is fatal for women, probably. So if a man is is on the X chromosome. We don't get, we men don't get an X chromosome, so we only get recessive, <clears throat> we only get the mother. But, um, and we, so if, if, the, if, if the woman has it, she doesn't have any manifestations, she's just a carrier. And if a man has it, he has manifestations in, uh, of the disease. We don't observe women <laughs> with, uh, with uh, it's very rare to find women with, uh, with uh, uh, both X chromosomes, male hemophilia. Um, now, this is a major screw up in the history of Europe caused by a gene like that. Now, this is Queen Victoria's family tree. And, uh, Queen Victoria is the one, is the second, uh, is the one in, right in the middle, half orange and half uh, white. So if they're round, they're, the balls are women and square are men. And uh, if it's uh, uh, half colored, she's a carrier. If it's all colored, is uh, is an affected child. So when Queen Victoria had her fifth child, but her first male. We're talking about monarchy. Males have some kind of importance here. The first male, the male turned Leopold. The male turned out to be hemophiliac, and uh, she was very, very upset. And her declaration was that um, their blood was strong, and there was no change in it, no weakness in it. So if we take her seriously. What would you think it happened? I mean, this thing has a incredible consequences. If you look at down here, and you see this this row of uh, seven of uh, five children with no descendant. That's the Russian family. They were exterminated by the uh, during the the Russian Revolution, and people say that um, the uh, the wife of uh, Nicholas II started seeing Rasputin was one of the major causes of the upsetting of the population because her first male born was a mochilic. So a major screw up. I mean this led to the withdrawal of the Russians from the sec from the First World War and big 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 changes. I mean we still pay taxes because they are communists, right? So uh, what do you think happened? Who is responsible for it? Let's start from the assumption that their, strong, their, their blood is strong. You say, okay, so poor Victoria had a mutation. Would you believe that? Poor Leopold had a mutation? How would you compute that? What I would do is look at the randomness of the distribution of those alleles in the second generation. 
We cannot genotype these people. We can infer their genotype only by looking at what they have, right? So you would expect that all these, uh, all these guys at the, on the third row, they are victorious uh, offsprings. You would expect a 50-50 distribution, right? Now, for some of them, we cannot really evaluate. We have two, we have two, three, we have to remove out because they don't have the same, and we don't know anything about that. If you take the other, we have one, two, we have one, two, uh, they are actually healthy, and we can almost say that. Um, and then we have three that are either affected or carriers. This is a good, this is a good 50%, right? I mean, I would say that you can't really get any better than that with this sample size. It's almost a perfect 50%. If you go down and look downstream, you will see that the ratio will be exactly the same. For the women of the, for, for the daughters of, uh, of Nicholas II, we cannot know. Uh, but if you look at the uh, iron there, you will see you have the same distribution. So I would say that from Victoria onward, everything is pretty consistent. So she did it. So, okay, she can have a mutation. Or she may um, have been cheating on her husband. No, because otherwise she'd been cheating with everybody, right? We, for all the children. We have a very pretty nice distribution of this. So what happened? How about her mother? Well, mother, we don't have really enough information. How about her father? Her father married a woman 20 years younger than he was. It was rumored to be homosexual. And uh, he died six months later, Victoria was born. A postman, maybe? If you have an hemophiliac postman, that would be a good explanation. Now, somebody made some research and found out that the grandmother of, uh, uh, of uh, Queen Victoria's had two affected siblings who died of hemophilia. So in this case, the blood is not really that strong because it's coming in from uh, toxic work, uh, from that line, and, uh, and becomes part of the uh, monarchy, of the uh, European aristocracy. You don't like this kind of gossip? I mean, this is... This, this. <laughs> I mean, this was really the story of the day, of the century, in, uh, at, at that time. But you see how we did it? We had to wait 200 and, 100 and something years to find out what really happened, because we had to observe, we cannot genotype these people at that time, so we had to observe their towards characters of, of their uh, thing. But if we were able to genotype them, what could we do? Well, we could look at this thing, of these small variations in their chromosomes. and. Uh, the oldest variation we have been able to use are called simple, uh, simple sequence repeats and microsatellites. So these are, uh, let me see if I have a slide explaining this now. So there are parts of the chromosome uh, of, of your genetic code in which you have sequences like G, A, T, A that are repeated several times in your chromosome, uh, in, in your genetic code. They are repeated 13th time in me, and 15 times in you, two times in somebody else. And uh, the, if we count these things, we can actually identify a region of the chromosome that by linkage, you remember, by being attached to it from, an evolution, from evolution of the corpuses, uh, will we'll identify a part, a stretch of the genome that we can actually tag. Now the problem is that simple sequence repeats and uh, a microsatellites um, have this little drawback. They cannot occur in really interesting regions. You cannot, you cannot change to match a genetic code by repeating the same thing 13 times or two times and hope to get coherent proteins out of it, right? So we are confined in intros in regions that by design are supposed to be kind of uninteresting from, an evolution, from, from a functional point of view. They may be interesting from an evolutionary point of view, but they're kind of leftover of, of, of something else. Now, SNPs have this great property. They are one single base. And so it's uh, something like this. You have your sequence, and you have that little base that in 
90% of the population is T and 10% of the population is G. To be sure that uh, to qualify a single change like this as a SNP and not just a simple mutation, it has to have a minimal occurrence in the population. And we stipulated this 1%, but nobody takes the number seriously because that's below the genotype error, the expected error. So when you genotype people, usually you have a higher cutoff to say, well, this is not really a SNP. This is something that is just due to genotype error. Um, <clears throat> they are also the most common type of variations. Not only they go in interesting places, but they can actually be in any place of the genome. And um, uh, they have different functions and different roles. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, protein coding. So a cSNP is a SNP occurring in a coding region. Uh, a rSNP is a SNP occurring in a regulatory, regulatory region. A sNP is a gene that occurs in a coding region, but by changing the SNP, you don't change the amino acid, right? We have all this redundant vocabulary of amino acids. And in this case, it's going to be functionally silent, but it's going to still to be a, uh, a, 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 a marker. Now, why actually we cannot do this? Um, what, why, why SNPs are important and why we cannot have microsatellites in other regions? Well, this is a very old study, uh, one of the very first. And what this uh, Kreitman guy did was to sequence 11 alleles from, uh, from a locus, from a gene uh, called alcohol dehydrogenase in Drosophila. Now, <clears throat> if you, you have 11 coding, genes, uh, coding regions and you have 14 sites that have alternative bases. Now, if you simply imagine that these are random changes, you would expect that about 70%, 75% of them will change the amino acid. Now, when you actually look at them, you see that basically none of them does. Why is that? Well, because this is a very important gene for this, this, this animal. They are born and they are nurtured in alcohol, um, like some of my friends in college. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they so the ability to de detoxify alcohol is going to be a very important evolutionary, um, evolutionary point for them. So nature cannot be a mistake, but it can, cannot, cannot, cannot give them so many um, uh, changes in a critical region. But I want to challenge a little your Darwinian souls. Mine, it's not that we observe them we have the change, the random change. We kill off 75% of them, and then we see that the remaining 25% are survived. These things just don't happen. There is no natural selection in terms of environment that is killing the 75 people, 75% of, of the Zophila. Okay? You with me? So in, in the Darwinian scheme, what we would expect is that you have a random mutation, you go out, you don't run fast enough, you get killed. In this case, you get a random mutation, the random mutation is selected by the environment in some way, typically by killing you, and then uh, before you can, you, can, you can reproduce, and that's it. But in this case, these things just don't happen. So there is no random change and then selection. There is something there in the control mechanism that will prevent the animal to have the mutation to begin with. Okay? This is the SNP map I was saying before. This is how you read the SNP, the SNP map. So you remember that you have two alleles for each locus. And in this case, what we have done is to genotype all these people, they are the rows, for these loci that are the columns. So if an individual has a blue spot, the blue spot means that he's homozygous at the major allele. So he has both chromosomes with the most frequent allele in it. 
in the most frequent in the population. If it's green, it's heterozygous, and if it's red, it's homozygous to the minor alleles. And if it's white, it's a mixed index. Now, how would you do an association study? Suppose I draw that red line and I tell you, you know, down here I have the phenotype, up there I don't have the phenotype. Could you make some association? Well, you know, if you look here, there are some genes that one side are all blue and one side are more colorful. You can do some statistics and say, well, this thing would allow me to distinguish between these two groups and they didn't and predict which one is going to get the SNP. Now, the, the phenotype. Now, I ask you a slightly different question. This is your SNP map. What is the phenotype? What makes these two groups different? Something that is observable. Can you say that? Come on. By a pizza. Guess. Why guess? No taker? Is a human yeah, it's a human map. These are two human samples. You got a pizza. Down there are African Americans. Up there are Caucasians. And uh, so to go back to your question, if you look, so the, the, the evolutionary pressure of a the, the link between two elements in the European population, take the uh, fifth and the, no, take the sixth and the seventh, two spots, right? There, you, uh, no, let me, let me do this this way. Take these two points, okay? These two points, if you study them, they go together. If you look at the statistics, they will go together. Why? if you do it in a, in, a, in a European population. Why? Because you don't have alternatives. You don't know if these things really go together because of some physical reason, or they're really just recombining like crazies, but we cannot observe because our population is a population that doesn't have that particular SNP. And this SNP exists only in this other population. In this case, is the African-American uh, people. Does this answer the question? Okay. Um, so, let me go back. So the um, the first quantitative law, we the most important quantitative law we have in uh, uh, in genetics, dictates how many major, minor, and heterozygous. Uh, people will have in a particular population. Let me, come on, okay. So in this case, you take a single allele and you can actually see that you have a, you expect to have more people with the homozygous at the major allele, less people heterozygous and less people that are uh, homozygous, at the main, uh, um, homozygous at the minor allele. Now, what, ru what rule exists there? To make, uh, to make, to distribute these proportions. So the, the law is the Hardy-Weinman law. It says that the probability of having a major allele, the minor allele, and, uh, uh, and the heterozygous is uh, this formula, is p squared plus 2pq plus 2q squared equal 1. We call this a situation of equilibrium. When everything is all right in the population, there hasn't been some major screw up, this is the law that dictates distribution. This is what we expect in the population in equilibrium. Now, in the hermaphroditic population gets an equilibrium in one generation by redistributing these things. Uh, we have no autosomal genes, so in our case, we need two generations to get, to get an equilibrium. Now, uh, you can use this to make a lot of little uh, games. Like, for instance, how many Caucasians are carriers of cystic fibrosis? Well, we know that cystic fibrosis affects one out of 2,500 uh, Caucasians. So this is our Q squared, right? So 0 0.02 is going to be our Q. 
and the number of non-affected alleles is going to be 98, 0, 98, 98%, right? So we can plug P and Q up there and compute uh, the 2Q, P, Q as uh, 1 out of 25, which is a remarkably high number for a disease like this. Now, we make all these calculations under some assumptions. First assumption we make is random mating, which is not a justification to have sex with anybody, but is the mechanism of reproduction that we imagine that exists in our population. That is, the person you will mate with will not select you on the basis of a particular genotype. If you're interested in that particular genotype, she will not ask you for your uh, uh, genetic map and say, no, you have a T in this locus, I don't want you. Okay? If, if, if this is the case, all our calculations go down the drain. Well, we can make some adjustment, but. Uh, the consequence of this is that we have a lot of problems when the selection is based on uh, things that are proxies, like being my relative. If somebody is my relative, I am going to introduce a bias because I'm going to select her on the basis of her genetic code. I know I don't do this for, for the genetic code, but I'm going to, have, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, um, the other assumption we have is that we have an infinite population, which is kind of sensible for, for 6 billion people. Um, so the other thing we, is, so why we need this assumption? Well, because we know that the mechanism of, uh, um, of uh, spread of a character in the population is called growth. It's the way in which a particular, a particular allele will get into the population and either conquer it all or just simply disappear, right? So at some point, we will reach some kind of evolutionary stability in which these things will be around. And the problem, we have a problem with this, the moment in which pe uh, people in the, uh, mate locally, because again, this creates some particular population, some, some, some particular bias due to the fact that your fishing pond is too small. So at the end, you're going to erase everything in that particular population. If everybody mates with each other in a particular, even a very small population, whatever we can say about variation is going to disappear. Now, the contrast of the, what is opposite of the drift is mutation. So we have these random mutations that come up and show up in our genome. But as you can see, the funny thing between this mechanism, that is, whatever we observe is drift and mutation. Mutation introduces changes. Drift makes this change stable, so just get rid of them. It's in sharp contrast with what we've been taught in high school. That is, there is some kind of selection. What is selection here? Where people get eaten? Where people don't run fast enough? Is there a way to account for selection in this? Yes, there is. So let's give a quantitative representation of selection. A quantitative representation of selection is a function. It's a function of fitness. They will tell you how good is somebody with that particular SNP, with particular Leo, to survive in this particular environment, right? Now, so suppose you have a, an allele that has a distribution of 0, 6 and 0, 4. So you apply hard divider law, uh, and you have that distribution of homozygous and heterozygous in your population. Then you have a function. We have a fitness function that will tell you that you have uh, a zero. Your your your, your um, selection rate will be. 0.2, because you're going to say that if you have the major allele or the heterozygous, you are all right. Your probability of survival is, is, is 1. If you are, if you are uh, homozygous with the minor allele, you have a diminished capacity to survive. So we can compute out of this fitness function a selection function of 0.2 that will tell us how many people we lose in a particular category at each generation. Now, if you look at the effect on the first generation, you see that there is an increase in the, uh, um, in, in the, in the homozygous of the major allele, a decrease in the homozygous and the heterozygous, and a sharper decrease in the 
um, almost like we said, the minor value ohm. But there is something funny here, that because we use a differential there, the smaller is the number of individuals that are homozygous at the minor allele, the smaller will be their depletion, right? So this mutation, that's a mutation doesn't really go away ever. It will simply stay there and slowly be taken out, taking, taking out individuals, but it will be lurking in the genetic code for the years to come. Okay? We have no explanation in this way of why dinosaurs disappear. This simply tells us that a particular mutation will keep floating in our population and we have no good mathematical model to explain how they will disappear. Now, that's this, everything is based on, on, on Hardy-Weinberg well, right? Does it really work? So this guy, this Rachel Sanger in 1975, uh, in England, they made this, uh, uh, ex this, uh, this, this experiment. They um, took blood samples, uh, the, these are blood groups, uh, which are again governed by one single uh, allele. And they um, look at the population of this group, this random population, and they found that if you compute the expected values using uh, Hardin-Weinberg and you compute the values in, and you observe the values, these numbers are remarkably similar. You see, so we would expect 361.54 to be mm from a Hardy Weinberg, we get 363. Uh, we get 636 for MN, and we get 334. Now, these numbers are so similar that somebody wrote a paper showing that actually they have been falsified. Because you don't, the, the precision of this number is above any reasonable statistical expectation of precision for a particular law. Okay? But let's say they falsified the number because they didn't know statistics and they didn't know they could get away with a better result. But let's buy these things. We've seen in other population that it's not really that close, but it really works. But we've also seen some population in which that really work. So beta hemoglobin uh, sickle cell uh, anemia in West Africa. If you look, if you compute the, uh, the, the distribution using Hardy-Weinberg, and you compute and you observe the distribution of the population, you have this remarkable change. Look at the difference of those two numbers. We expect that to have 254, and as a matter of fact, we have uh, 64. Why? Say again. Okay. I think, I, no, I made a mistake. It's flipped. So we have, sorry, we have 600 and something, not 64. This is 645. So your explanation is, is the opposite. So you have to explain the opposite phenomenon, not way smaller, but because it's bigger. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you, have a, you see you have more homozygous, heterozygous in the middle. Oh, no, no, the number is correct. So this is the thing. <laughs> the inconsistent thing is that you have too many heterozygous Given the, homozyg given the homozygous on the minor alleles. You shouldn't have them. You see? You get two pizzas. Because the heterozygous get the protection against malaria. So in doing so, you have a bias to having a lot of heterozygous in the middle and keep the allele around in the population, and the other below there doesn't remain, uh, uh, does, doesn't, doesn't really change. But the selective advantage is this for these uh, 5,400 people who have the heterozygous. So in that particular case, this is something that probably wouldn't be a good uh, test to make here, because here malaria is not really a big issue. But in West Africa, it's going to be a big problem. If we uh, did, the, did that test at birth or before birth, would it be? Consistent with the prediction before birth. I mean, if you did, if you did the same distribution of the alleles before they had this pressure of malaria. Well, that's is a that where is it the dying off factor that's causing the difference? No, there is no, there is no that. Well, so let's put it in this way. 
we actually do it before they're born because the selection is actually on their parents. The pressure, as usual, is on the parents. So if you keep these things around, the chances that these people will go in older age and reproduce are higher. So we, the entire population has a global advantage in keeping around this uh, particular, um, uh, particular um, variation, but only in a particular form, which is the heterozygous. The homozygous is going to be too bad for you, but the heterozygous is going to strike a nice balance between getting the disease and, uh, uh, and uh, actually being protected by, uh, against malaria. If you do something like this here, you change the environmental condition, you're screwed. Here, I, I'm pretty sure that if you do the same, uh, uh, the same test, this will not show up because the population as a whole doesn't have a, uh, a, um, a, 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 a pressure for this. Now, how do we map these things? How do we use a marker as such? Well, first, we want to find the genetic basis of genotype for a particular disease that is our phenotype. And what's the mindset for somebody looking for this? We are not really looking for the SNP or the mutation that is changing that. We are trying to find the marker that is in the proximity. Well, we'll be happy to find the marker that is in the proximity of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the actual cause. So the mindset is more or less this one. I have a marker, and I observe in my data set a dependency between my phenotype and my marker. But in reality, the extent of my claim cannot be this marker caused this phenotype. The extent of my claim can only be this marker is linkage to equilibrium with some real genotype that I haven't observed that is actually causing the phenotype. And you see where the complexity starts emerging. The first complexity is that the phenotype and the genotype and the phenotype may have a complex form of causality. They may have an interaction with an environmental condition. Or so they have incomplete penetrance. And the other thing is that how good is the linkage to equilibrium between the marker and the genotype? I don't expect to have everybody getting exactly the same pair of genotypes, right? So this is where stochasticity comes in. And this is what is making our life slightly more complex, but definitely more interesting. Now, traits don't really follow uh, single gene models. If you look at the list of diseases they gave, they are kind of minor diseases. Minor, they have small incidents, they're horrible diseases, but they are not going to save 50% uh, of people who die of stroke, or uh, people who have diabetes, or people that have this for more complicated um, 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 alleles uh, structures that cause more interesting diseases. On the other hand, even some Mendelian traits are actually complex. So if you look, if you look at the, uh, the so uh, uh, the sickle cell anemia is a classical Mendelian disease, but, so we know why you have it. But the phenotypic variability of the disease is immense. There are children that die at 13 by stroke. And there are people that live forever and they're perfectly healthy people. We don't know why this happened. We know these people get the disease, but we don't know what the, why, why this happened. And so people are, for instance, studying the, uh, the early mortality uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, kids with uh, sickle cell anemia, try to find for another SNP. And they say, well, you know, these people get this particular disease that is genetically found. Maybe the difference between their long-term long survival uh, the, the chance of their long-term survival is really due exclusively to another SNP. And so they are almost finding it. Another problem is incomplete penetrance when you have an interaction with another variable. This is a recent very famous case called BCR1. BCR1 is a, is a, uh, is a gene, is a particular locus that will uh, be predictor of the greater risk of developing breast cancer in a woman. Now, we know that it's very difficult for a woman to develop breast cancer before menopause. 
So you expect in their 40s to have a very low incidence. But if you look at, if you average all this, uh, the, the, the population in, uh, across people with BCR1 and people without BCR1, you will see that the evidence is not really that big. They get a slightly increase in chances of developing the breast cancer. But if you split them according to their age, so you use age as an environmental factor, you see how the changes increase a long time. So when you're 40, it's 37 chances, 37 percent chances. But when you're 80, it's 85 percent chances that it's going to make a change. But if you put them all together, eh, you average something that is not such a clear result. On the other hand, the challenge here is actually to find out which is the environmental factor that is actually doing the deed. This place to find out that this age that is splitting this, uh, these women in these different groups. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a necessary sufficient problem, but we have also a redundancy problem. For instance, we have retinitis pigmentosa that may be caused by 14 independent SNPs, mutations. Right? So any of these mutations will show up positive to a particular genetic test uh, for, for association with, uh, with, uh, with, with, um, with the disease. And uh, we have other diseases that, that are unknown to have polygenic causes. If you have only one of these, you will not develop the disease, like the Hirschsprung disease, in which you need two different uh, mutations on two different chromosomes, which, by the way, opens an interesting question on what is the relationship, the evolutionary relationship of objects that leave of loci that are on two different chromosomes? They are completely independent. Well, we have very complex systems that are displaced around, they have their genes displaced around different chromosomes. And we are able to rebuild this system from one generation to another. How do we combine this with the idea that if you measure things by centimorgan, two things, it doesn't make any sense to have, to compare the distance of two loci onto different chromosomes. So this is a notion, a kind of a radical notion, but uh, proposed in the 30s by Sir Ron Fisher, father of statistics and modern genetics, uh, under the name of affinity. He didn't have genotypes at that time, but he wrote a paper on nature talking about this very strange phenomenon and how unlikely it was that there was really no relationship on things that were very far on the, on, on the genetic code, in this coding he was imagining. Uh, and they were at the same time functionally tightly related. Um, <clears throat> So how do we understand, how we try to dissect all this, this, uh, this, this, this complex st stuff, and also the simple one? Well, you know, the traditional way is to do the same game we did for Victoria's Secrets, right? Uh, find the large pedigree, wait, you know, those 150 to 100 years, and see what happened across three generations. We can do this with Drosophila much faster, but if we want to approach human diseases, Drosophila doesn't really always pattern. So if you want to study this thing in, in humans, what do we do? One is to find a large, uh, a large pedigree. One is to say, well, you know, I don't really need a large pedigree. What I can get are trios. I get mother, father, and child, a very modern nuclear family. And then I imagine, because I know the parents, I imagine that they will get statistical evidence of transmission by repeating the same measurement in different trios. Right? Like they were a huge pedigree. And in this case, I can do everything in two generations. Um, <clears throat> I can have, uh, but sometimes for some diseases, uh, finding parents is very difficult. If you're looking up for two complex traits that uh, show up late in age, uh, there are people that are actually studying the, the, the basis of longevity. And they recruit people in their 90s, late 90s, early first century early second century, it's kind of difficult to track down their parents. And most of all, it's difficult to try to genotype them. So what do you do in this case? You get brothers. If you get a brother, you try to figure out what was the genotype 
So you assume that there is some kind of random distribution of these things across the two, the two children, and you try to figure out what was the original uh, genotype of the, of the parents. Or you can do a standard case control experiment in which you collect a, a bunch of people, half of them or a quarter of them have the disease, half of them don't have the disease, and compare the, uh, the association between a SNP, a mutation, and the observable trait. There is another uh, way to categorize these experiments. One is, one of the experiments they are like double-sided, like a case control experiment. I have two, both sides of the story, the affected and the not affected. Or I can have single-sided uh, studies, and I will show you how to, you analyze them, in which you recruit parents, they are, usually, they are healthy parents, with an affected child. And you try to see what is the transmission that goes from parents to child that make the child affected. In this case, all your pool, all your recruited pool, would be made by people that are either affected or related to an affected person, which actually makes usually life much easier for the recruiter. Because if I have to give to, to volunteer for a study, if I am affected or my child is affected, I'm going to be more willing to volunteer for the study than if I'm just a random bozo that doesn't have the disease. And by design, I have to be independent of any subject with the disease. So uh, I will go into details for each of these studies. So the first thing we can do is to uh, do linkage analysis. That is the traditional analysis of pedigrees. The second way we can do, we can go, is to um, is allele sharing. You remember what I was telling you about about brothers and and uh, and siblings in general. So if you have siblings, what you can do is to imagine that there is a random distribution for a particular SNP, for a particular mutation, and you would expect that if you have two brothers, these two brothers will have a particular probability of getting one allele or another. Now, if you, start, if you start deviating from this distribution, then you start becoming a bit suspicious. Uh, the association studies are standard case control studies in which you compute the likelihood that a particular SNP is causing, affecting your outcome. TDT, transmission disequilibrium test, is the thing we actually use for uh, uh, the trios, uh, and I will tell you in a second. And uh, then for uh, complex traits like quantitative traits, things that are not really binary diseases, but are, for instance, your resistance to um, your inclination to start drinking, which may have different degrees, or your inclination to quit smoking, which again can have different degrees. Um, the best way of doing them, of looking at these quantitative traits, is to, is to use uh, animal models. So crosses, which is not something we are allowed to do in humans. <coughs> Typically, this collection are hypothesis driven. So what these people do is they wake up in the morning, they have read a lot of papers before, the night before, uh, and they take a shower and they say, oh, TR7 may be related to my disease. So they go out, they ask money, they recruit a bunch of people. Uh, use the money to genotype these people, run an experiment, and write a paper in which they either find something or they find nothing. Usually if you don't find nothing, you don't write the paper. And this in induced misbehavior in scientists. The challenge here is that doing this is, uh, you know, the old-fashioned way. What is very precious for us today are, in this case, the samples of people. So imagine you have a single drop of sample of, 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 from an individual, and you can do a gazillion of these things. But in this case, you don't have to le read a lot of papers. What you can do is, uh, or you can have your doubts. You can say, well, maybe it's not only this one. Maybe it's the second, maybe it's the third, maybe it's the fifth. What if I collect 500 SNPs and I test all of them? What if I do an analysis that we not collect any SNP, we collect all of them and try to look to fish for dependencies in that uh, in, in the data set. Okay, in this case, it becomes really, really difficult. This is how things used to be done. Uh, 
and this is a this is a three generation four generation uh, liquid study. Uh, and in this case, you have uh, a particular disease, and people are affected. There are the red ones. People are not affected. Are the bluish one, and uh, you study a mechanism of transmission for a particular SNP, for a particular mutation. And what you do is use a quantity called log likelihood ratio or log score test. What is this? You develop a method, a, a model of transmission that is uh, accusing that particular disease, the SNP, to be responsible for the disease. Okay? So the tracking down of the SNP will follow, the, 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 the transmission of the SNP, of the mutation, will follow the pattern of the observable characters in the individuals you see. And then you make another one in which, is, in which the mutation is not responsible for it. And then using very simple statistical methods, you can compute that the data that you observe are generated by one model, and the data that you observe are generated by the other model. And you can compare these two models. And you say the model in which, and you can say the model in which this mutation is responsible for the disease, that is, is following the same pattern of inheritance, is n times more probable or less probable than the hypothesis in which the two patterns are not associated to each other. Now, the problem here is that if you have a, if you have a large pedigree of you have a, 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 a many SNPs, you end up in the problem of um, multiple comparisons. So. I have to tell you this because this is my job, but I don't believe in this. But if you one day want to publish a paper using standard statistical classical things, you will end up in a thing called, uh, in a muddy area called multiple comparisons. Now, multiple comparisons comes from uh, a classical, come from a classical um, superstition and from the classical statistics. That is that you can infer you can say that two things are different. If you can, by repeating the experiment a hundred times or a million times or sometimes, you will get less than 0 0.05 mistakes. You have heard of this p-value. This is the p-value. Is the probability that you will make an error by assuming that hypothesis more than n times. Okay, in this case, it's five times out of a hundred. Now, if I'm testing one hypothesis, this is my error level. Suppose that I'm testing two hypotheses. Well, the probability that I will do this by chance doubles. So it's going to be the product of these two probabilities, right? Because these are two joint probability distribution. Suppose I'm observing 500. So it becomes 0 0.05 times 0 0.05, smaller number. Suppose I have. 500 steps. What should I do? That number would become so small that it would be impossible to prove any, anything. Because the number would be, because the probability that I pick up one hypothesis by chance would be so high that they will need a lot of evidence, an unseemly amount of evidence, to accept a particular hypothesis. So, frequentist people have this problem, uh, patient people don't. Uh, but it's a problem. If you want to publish in a journal, uh, this, is a, this is something you will... Uh, uh, okay. So this is a non-parametric... Allele sharing is the thing I was telling you before. Non-parametric method to assess linkage. And what you do is you use uh, siblings. And you assume that your particular SNP is identical, but the distribution of the SNP, of this mutation, is identical by descent. So I know what is the distribution I expect, and what I can do is to see for a particular SNP if there is a deviation from the distribution I would expect if these two guys were getting the people, the way they, get, they were getting their mutation from the same pair of parents. Right? So these are siblings. I look at the probability that we get this SNP by chance, and if they don't get the SNP by chance because they're all affected, what we find out is that these people that are actually affected have a greater chance of getting this particular SNP. 
and this will make my SNP suspicious. Make, making it suspicious doesn't mean that you prove it. Now, if you want to prove something like this from a statistical point of view using a non-parametric method, because you make no assumption about the distributional nature of your data, you are going to have to need a huge amount of data. And this is not always feasible. Um, well, this is really, really feasible. So this is a weak test because it's simply telling you the only thing you prove is that that particular leo is transmitted more than in a different way than 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 random. Well, more than a random population. Now, association studies are typically done using parametric methods, and uh, they um, they <coughs> they test for association between uh, uh, between a particular phenotype and the and the genotype in two sets, in two different populations, well, in two different samples. What is the problem? Is that sometimes you recruit your sample from two different populations. Uh, I know it sounds absolutely silly, but this is one of the major concerns. Suppose they, the people in red are all people with asthma, and people with blue are all people that without asthma. But then, and they go and find out an association between the SNP and this word, and a mutation and, and, and this phenotype. But then I discover that for some reason, I have recruited everybody with asthma from Finland and everybody with, uh, um, um, with, uh, without asthma from Sicily. Now, is this SNP going to account for asthma or is this SNP going to, be account, going to account for whatever our difference is between these two populations? These are called population admixtures, and I know it sounds silly for people to recruit things across different, uh, popu uh, across different uh, uh, countries um, or very segregated populations. On the other hand, may have, you have no guarantee that you don't have stratifications in your population. Even if you recruit in beautifully multicultural Massachusetts, mm -hmm. the probability that you will find out something about the, um, something about uh, your sample that you don't really like, like a stratification, is not is not negligible. So, what is really really um, what is really really trendy today is to use transmission disequilibrium tests. Transmission disequilibrium tests rest on the assumption that you're actually using the parents of an individual as its controls. So you're sure you are not going to get any stratification, right? So I'm going to recruit a bunch of triads, father, mother, and child. And the child is affected, and the parents are not affected. OK? And then what I'm going to do is to compute for each particular SNP, for a particular SNP, for a particular mutation, uh, if there is a dependency, if there is a pattern, so to speak, between my uh, distribution of transmission and the fact that all these kids are actually affected. And in this way, I have a very powerful test and have non-stratified controls. The only problem is that it's not always easy, as I was saying, to find, to find parents for this. And the other problem is that you may find phenotypic stratification with that. Suppose you're looking for a particular disease that is uh, uh, related to weakness. Uh, an example I have is uh, cholera. There are, people believe that there is a SNP, and people are looking for a SNP that is uh, uh, more, more, um, uh, making people more susceptible to have a bad outcome from cholera. And what they do is to go and recruit uh, the people in households. So when somebody shows, shows up in the hospital, they recruit the entire household and use the parents as control. Now at that point, the problem is, because the phenotype is not really that easy to identify, we don't know if these people, for instance, got an immunity 20 years before because they got cholera. These are parents of a child who, has 50, who is 15 years old. In places where they have serious cholera, usually these are still young people. But from the societal structure, they're kind of old people. They've been there around for like 35 years. And this means that at that point, you have this particular population that, by design, has a very different a very, a phenotype that is very difficult to characterize. So QTL are uh, traits that, like in this case, have variability in intensity. 
I'm not looking for something that is black and white. I'm looking for something with different degrees of, uh, uh, of, uh, of severity. And um, till last year, there was really no way of doing these things. Well, nobody has proven ways of doing this. Now, people are working very hard because QTR is actually one of the most interesting things. People are looking really hard to find ways to characterize at least some type of QTL. Um, and um, you can, and complex QTL, like QTL with the sensors uh, data. So one of the studies we have been doing is about um, uh, the development of uh, breast development in women. You say, why? Well, uh, because breast development has been associated to uh, breast cancer. So we know that late breast development is protective of breast cancer, or at least one type of breast cancer. Now, <clears throat> this is a QTL. Why? Because you're looking at age, which is not, a, which is not a, a binary variable. And it's a very complicated QTL because is, um, you may have sensor data. You may have uh, girls that at some point decide for one reason or another to drop off the study. So the way in which you can organize for this particular QTL, not for every QTL, is to imagine it to represent the structure as a survival study, in which you imagine that your SNP, the particular SNP, is going to be a treatment, and the other is going to be the control. You draw your couple of curves, in this case not for survival, but for breast development, which is a kind of a deadline point. And at the end, you can compute the difference between these two samples and get evidence that actually there is a factor there that is putting them together. And you can use other multivariate structures that allow you to, 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 to study the interaction of, of, uh, of, um, of SNPs in, um, in QTL. But typically, if you want to have a general model for QTL, you have to resort to um, animals, animal models. Now, there is another interesting thing that is happening on this street, mostly. Um, and has been happening for the past four or five years. That is, we have two or three large phenotypic studies um, run by Harvard and, and, uh, and affiliated hospitals. The oldest one is known as the Framingham Heart Study. Framingham Heart Study collects, I don't know, 50,000 people. They've been followed. Now they are the third generation. They've been followed. They're Family members have been followed. We know about these people basically everything. Um, the, these are selected for heart disease, but there are also studies, there are four studies that have not been selected for anything, like the nurses' study. Nurses are wonderful individuals, incredibly compliant to doctor's order. So even if you harass them for 30 years, asking them every other year a complete report of what they have done diseases they have, what is their diet, how much they weigh, they will comply. Nurses study has 150,000 women that every other year go and fill a questionnaire just for the sake of it. So about these women, and this is now, now in the second generation, we know absolutely everything. We know how much carrots they eat every year. And uh, uh, you probably see one reason why you see this uh, articles in the New York Times that come out of channels, uh, of the, they say the School of Public Health, but usually they mean the channel in this case. There are people who own this data. And these articles are like, uh, you know, red hair are going to make you live longer, or, you know, uh, <laughs> eating uh, five carrots a day has been associated to having brighter eyes. Where those findings come out from? From the nurse study. There are these people that mind the data set. Again, they don't read in this case. They take a shower in the morning and say, what well, I can go and look into the nurse's study? And say, well, how about the association between mascara and blindness? You have 150,000 women that use mascara every day. Well, actually, you probably have a good proportion that uses mascara, a good proportion that doesn't use mascara, and you know it. So they go there. And the joke on the street is that they don't publish on New England Journal, they publish directly on the New York Times. Because these are usually very high impact questions that people get right away. 
But imagine if you can take all those things, all those phenotypes, and you could genotype those women. We have blood for about 90,000 of them, and run a full genetic call, uh, uh, scan for these women. What would you do? You could find an association between mascara and SNPs, or blindness and SNPs, or whatever and SNPs. Can we do this? Why don't we do it? Well, OK, genotype and SNP cost about 45 cents. This is Rachel know very well. To uh, snip a, 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 an individual map is going to cost, so, sorry, a, an individual map is going to be about 90,000. OK? So 1,000 individuals is going to cost you 90 million. And is, there are money that are very difficult to find. In that, in, that, in that structure. In, 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 if, you, if you go to NIH and ask for this kind of money, you're not going to get them. Work is not a problem. Postdocs at Harvard are cheap, and they work very hard. So we could actually have in a, a complete, uh, a thousand of complete SNP maps in about 7,000 days, man, which is about uh, two years for 10 postdocs. Nothing. How can we solve this problem? Well, you remember when we said that these things go together? Maybe we don't need to genotype all of them. This is an example of a gene. I don't remember which, I don't remember which gene is it. Uh, but this is a gene, this is a map of a gene that tells you the distance in terms of R square, which is the measure I was telling you before the distance between two, the, 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 the Paris distance between two points. Um, and as you can see, you can identify blocks there, the blue areas, in which the correlation among this, the R square in this area is so high that you don't really need to genotype all of them. You can just decide where you go. And you say, OK, pick any of them. Problem is, to know this, you first have to genotype them. <laughs> so at that point, there is no much, much purpose for it. But um, and the other problem is, once you have this, so here is CZ, right? When I have a region, that region of the combination, there are four or five of low recombination, I can say, OK, I pick up one, two, three, four. Now the question is, which one I pick? Now suppose I don't have five. I have, like in this case, 59, which are not that many. There are regions like this that are 229 long. So, well, your guess. How many SNPs do I need to genotype? Not which ones, of course. It would require a little. But how many do I need to genotype here to account for all the variations? So these are the SNPs, and these are all the combination I get in the population. Okay. These things go together, so I don't expect to see all possible combinations. How many of them I will need to account for the 14 different alternative variations of TLR7 over these 59 SNPs? I want a number. Jose, you're up to your third pizza? I mean, 15, 2, 10? OK, we have a 10 here. Anybody getting closer? That's a good guess. You all buy 10? Buy 10? Five. These five SNPs allow you to reconstruct all the variations without any information loss. I have a guy at Channing, a good friend of mine, and when we developed the method to identify this thing, uh, bought me dinner because he has spent two years staring at these pictures and trying to figure out which were the things to genotype. And actually, when he was wrong, getting a lot of shit from people because, they say, oh, you got me the wrong thing. Now imagine it's a mind numbing task to stare at this picture and try to find out which is the right one, which are, which are the optimal one to genotype. Um, 
So what they've been doing is to play with a structure called haplotypes. Haplotypes are the things you get from your mother and from your father, and they're a stretch of the genome that is consistent one chromosome on another. Now, the problem with haplotypes is that they're very difficult to identify for us. When you sequence somebody, you're going to have maps that look like the one I showed before. I can tell you if you're heterozygous, homozygous on major allele, homozygous on the of the minor allele, but it's very, I cannot give you two bases. So if that particular SNP is uh, as A and T, as two alternative bases, I can tell you if you are AT, TT, AA, but I cannot tell you if you are TA. I cannot decide if two things are coming both from your parent, from your mother, or both from your father, which is exactly the kind of information we need to build this kind of maps to reduce this information. So these structures are called haplotypes. And uh, there are molecular methods that are horribly expensive to do this. So they go into the, into the, the chromosomes and they tear apart the chromosome and return two separate chromosomes. And you know that one is coming from your mother and one is coming from your father. There are stochastic methods to do this in which you can try to figure out by making some assumption how the things are transmitted on the population what is the distribution of the SNPs, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of an entire haplotype. But um, <clears throat> the best way of doing this is to use trios and try to guess what is the SNP that is coming from the mother and which is the one coming from the father. And so what people are doing now is uh, developing a thing called HapMap in which we will have a map. You can go to hapmap.org and you will find all the data that are currently available. Uh, there is a, is a systematic, now the resolution is 30,000 bases, 30 kilobases, a, a systematic genotyping of all SNPs on a relatively small population, there are 33 years, in which we can actually find out which are the phases. The fact that one is coming from the father and the mother is called the phase of a genotype. We can identify the phases from the parents. And why you do this? Well, because next time we want to design a genetic, a genetic study, I, can, I don't have to run the genetic study and then say, oh, I could have just genotyped this one. I can actually go there, see I'm interested in this particular gene, find out which are the SNPs that they really need to genotype. Um, but there is some even more good news that apparently all these things actually go together in stretches. So this is a paper from a couple of years ago in which they show that in the, they, they made a fine resolution map of a region of chromosome 4 associated with Crohn's disease. And what they found, aside from the clinical things, what they found out is that this region is actually, from an evolutionary point of view, broken in 11 subregions. These regions are stable. They are transmitted together, so to speak, and they're interrupted once in a while by higher regional recombination. And not only this, they found out that if you look at all these variations, uh, of the alternative uh, common haplotypes you have in the population, they actually come, you see the different colors? They actually come from four ancestral haplotypes that are recombined, have been recombined over the generations. So again, this goes back to your question. I'm not sure that there is, from a physical point of view, there is no, you see the, the big block there in the, in the middle, 92 bases, kilobases? Well, I'm not entirely sure that there is not a very high recombination spot there. But because they all come from four haplotypes with no other variation, I cannot see any recombination there. Because the probability of recombining requires a little pool to fish from, and in this case, the pool to fish from is very, very poor. Needless to say, these are all Caucasians, and they all come from this handful of individuals. So apparently these people all come, there's 129 um, seed pairs, uh, not seed pairs, uh, three years. They all come from four ancestral haplotypes. The way you do is to use uh, hidden mark of, the way you identify this block is to use hidden mark of models. I uh, will talk about hidden mark of models next week um, in, uh, for, for, for the machine learning methods, so I will not uh, bother you with this. Also because, uh, um, 
And at this point, what we can do, once we have these blocks, is to identify the SNPs that are tagging those particular blocks and then run them. And the saving we have, we're shown, is an exponential saving with length. So it's about, it's an average 10%, but if your block is very big, the number of SNPs you will need will be much smaller than 10%, and if it's a small block, the number of SNPs you will need will be a bigger block, will be a, a bigger number. Um, so the take home message, the fundamental take home message for, for a medical class is that all these technology has these beautiful properties of finding out stuff. But the only way to find out this stuff is to have good phenotypes. One day, running a SNP will cost one cent. Maybe it will cost a tenth of a cent. Near to nothing. But what makes very precious, what makes these studies possible, is the fact that you have something like the nurse study, that you have critically annotated, carefully recorded phenotypes, and nicely characterized. And this is where the other side of medical knowledge comes in. Not to find out what is really the cause, but just to identify precisely, as crisply as possible, a particular phenotype. At that point, you can actually map the phenotype. If you, your phenotype is, is, uh, is um, slippery, yeah, well, it's very hard you will find any association. And if you find it, it probably will not be association with the thing you want because that's going to be a different phenotype, the one you're thinking. So the critical thing here is not to go back to the very first slide, is not really to do beanbag genetics. The real critical thing here is to have good medicine that is able to characterize phenotypes that in turn allow these studies to happen and to create good explanation for, for, for these phenotypes. And the other big take home message is that uh, hypothesis driven is out of fashion. We don't need hypotheses anymore. With enough money, we can enough skills, we have the intellect and we enough phenotypes. We have enough information, we have enough juice to go and get our answer without thinking them in the shower. But looking systematically at the genome and taking advantage of the fact that something is more uh, likely than something else. So if they tell you that something is associated to something else and this is my only study, we will need 10 years before people can consolidate these studies in a meta-analysis study and say, oh, the evidence is not that big. But if I start telling you, you know, I analyze uh, 500 or 5,000 or 50,000 SNPs, and here it comes. This SNP is a million times more probable than any other SNP to be associated with this phenotype. That's a measure that you cannot get from an hypothesis-driven uh, test. So, okay, so when you will be reviewers of papers and grants, that usually bug people because their studies are not hypothesis-driven, remember this. See you next.